Hi, I'm Mark Dewinsky. I'm here with uh, Jamie Foster, a state representative, and uh, we want to ask some questions. Thank you so much for having me here. So why don't we start off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Um, sure. So I live in Ellington with my family. I have my husband's name is Aaron. He's an engineer and I have two little kids. Um, my daughter Leona is six and my son Bennett is 15 months. And we really are happy to be a part of the Ellington East Windsor Vernon community. Um, I've been volunteering and serving on boards and commissions ever since my family moved to Ellington. Um, we actually moved to Ellington um, right after college, my husband and I. It was a good halfway point between our initial jobs. And it was, I, we like instantly fell in love with the community. And I felt like the pace of life in town was slower than what I was used to around. When someone asked you to say hi at the grocery store, they'd say, hey, how are you? And they would actually expect you to stop and tell them how you were. <laughs> it wasn't sort of like a greeting that people said in passing. And I think that's missing from a lot of places. And I liked the idea of raising our family in a place where that was sort of in the cultural fiber of the community. Very nice, very yeah. nice. Now that you're part-time legislative, um, what do you do outside of the time representing Ellington, East Windsor, and Vernon? Yeah, so my entire career has been in the food security anti-hunger space. So I do nutritional sciences research. I have a PhD, um, and I got that at UConn, the College of Ag Health and Natural Resources. And I have been spending most of my career doing um, research to help people who might not have enough access to healthy food um, prevent nutrition-related chronic disease. And so right now I work at the Yale Griffin Prevention Research Center, um, which is like jointly housed between the Yale School of Public Health and Griffin Hospital. Um, I spend most of my time on the Griffin Hospital side of things. And we are working on produce prescriptions. So we give people fruits and veg, and we hope that it improves their health outcomes, and typically it does. Um, and it's a cool um, bit of research that we're doing because there's a growing amount of policies across the country that are actually looking at the kind of research that we do to help make determinations of, if we do this, does it save taxpayer dollars through Medicaid spending? Does it improve the economic livelihood of farmers? Does it make people's health and wellness better um, down the road and prevent hospitalization and improve management of diabetes? And do people feel like the program is worthwhile and valuable? And right. so I'm happy to be doing that research. Now, does that background, that helps you in what you do for the state uh, legislation, correct? Yeah, I have spent a lot of time in the last couple of years championing a particular program called the Farmer's Market Nutrition Program. And so that specific program is, in all intents and purposes, food is medicine. Um, it gives uh, farmers markets the opportunity to double or add more money to um, people who are spending money on SNAP or WIC um, or senior market vouchers. and. We know that these programs are viewed as a high value product mm -hmm. for the people who are using it, but we also know it invests back into farm and agricultural economies. So farmers who accept these vouchers actually make more money than they would if they were just selling at a farm stand and did not accept these programs. So it's a really win-win program that we've been championing, and I've been a really strong champion at the legislature for investing in it. But I'd say beyond my specific expertise, being a research scientist, I think, is important at the Capitol. I think the scientific method is how good um, policy is made. You ask a question, you identify a problem, you do research, you, th you think, oh, I could solve this problem by introducing this policy. Typically, that is your hypothesis in the scientific method of how you could answer a question or fix a problem, but we do it through policy. And then you get a public hearing. So you're not necessarily experimenting through the policy, but you are doing a public hearing and you're soliciting public feedback from the experts and the community that you're going to serve. And then if people sort of form agreement around what the policy will be, it hopefully gets voted out of committee and then goes through both chambers and is passed and signed into law by the governor. But the scientific method helps you do great policy because I think great policy doesn't come by plucking an idea out of nowhere. It comes from really, really strong research and problem solving skills. No, oh, that's good. And it also sounds like all this stuff that you're doing, especially for the farmers, you're helping the working people. That's my goal in almost everything that I do. And what I'll say is in a community like ours in Ellington, East Windsor and Vernon, people's needs are really different. And I am not going to, for my life and my family alone, have the solution for everybody. And so I 
really do try and understand what's a challenge for people so that I could sort of tackle one problem at a time. This last um, session, we worked a lot on tax relief. And although I know that not everyone immediately is feeling tax relief across every group in every segment, we eliminated taxes on pensions and annuities and 401ks. It's the largest tax cut that our state has ever created. Um, and this tax cut um, it means that people who are retiring and living on a fixed income aren't paying state taxes on their retirement income if they're making under 150 k a year for a two-income household. And that is a lot of people in Ellington, East Windsor, and Vernon. And so for those folks, that tax cut is a huge change. Now, my husband and I are in the early stages of our career. We're not close to retirement. And we think about retirement and we're planning for retirement. But it's not something that I was thinking about the taxing infrastructure for, but that came from constituents. I talked to people right. and tried to solve their problem. Hmm. So what bill are you most proud of in the past few years? Last year, I was given a speaker's priority bill number. And so every year, the Speaker of the House gives a small number of legislators, two, three, four, um, really key topics that are important for the state as a whole. And he gave me House Bill 5003, and this was an act concerning child and maternal um, health and nutritional outcomes. Mm -hmm. The inspiration for this bill was a news article that the speaker had read that had said, um, children, we have a high rate of infant fatality in the state of Connecticut. It's not necessarily higher than our surrounding states, but it is certainly higher than it should be for a state and a nation with the resources that we have. And maternal outcomes are worse than they should be. And this report through the state said that one of the easiest, lowest hanging fruit intervention to prevent infant fatality and poor infant outcomes was WIC. So when families who are eligible to participating in this program get it, they do way better. More infants survive. Mm. And that's critically important. Um, and so I championed this bill last year that made it easier for parents to participate if they're eligible. And so 46% of eligible Connecticut families we're participating when we pass that bill. Our goal is to leverage every federal dollar that's coming and available for the state of Connecticut to use and make sure every penny of federal dollar that's coming goes to those families to help their outcomes. I, you know, if an infant fatality is preventable, we should prevent it. We should do everything in our power to make sure that that doesn't happen. But I've also worked on smaller constituent bills that are sort of one-off projects. We, we, there's a community in East Windsor, the School Hill Water Association, and a, that entire neighborhood does not have potable water. Mm. They haven't for years, decades. And so we funded through a specific grant program that I voted on in a state budget and we created this pot of money that would be available for bonding for towns that are economically disenfranchised, like East Windsor and Vernon. And towns like those can directly apply for this funding and they can get what they need to fix their community systems-wide issues. Well, they got this grant um, and now they're going to be able to bring city water to this whole community that hasn't had potable drinking water in years and fire suppression to the housing authority. And I am sad that that didn't exist already, but now we're remedying it. And so I think, you know, people always say like, oh, what, Ellington, East Windsor, Vernon, those towns have people who don't, can't drink their water? That can't be true. That sounds far-fetched, but it's a bigger number than people realize. And it's the thing that I want to work on and I want to see finished. <laughs> I want, I want to see, we've made a ton of progress in the last four years, but I really do want to see every person who lives in Ellington, East Windsor and Vernon, and really in the whole state of Connecticut, I don't want there to be any question about whether or not your water is safe to drink. And I feel passionate about That's that. Good. And it almost seems like you're, you're going through each step of the way, not just Ellington, but you're taking a look at the other towns around us to try and help out to make sure everyone's... Absolutely, and when you pass legislation on the state level, surrounding towns, the ones that I don't represent, also benefit from this. Um, in Tolland, they have communities that have road salt damage. We have that in Ellington as well. Um, 
And those communities, they are also eligible for progress. We passed legislation that allows the um, Public Utility Regulatory Authority to order the takeover of a water system if there's a public health threat. And that legislation doesn't just help the School Hill Water Association, that helps every water system across the state that may have a dangerous contaminant. And that's unfortunately not just in our neck of the woods, it's it's a problem that many towns have to deal with. That's great. And it sounds like you're really, you know, taking a um, priority, you know, and making sure that, that you're doing things right, which is nice. Mm -hmm. um, so what is your constituent work like? Um, so I, I really believe that this is sort of the best part about being a state representative as opposed to the other. I represent 23,000 people, and I give 23,000 people my cell phone number. <laughs> and so I go around, and as I go door to door, I give people my phone number, and I give people my email address, and I host um, community forums and coffee hours and listening sessions. And when a bill is coming that I think is of interest to the community, I convene relevant stakeholders on both sides of the issue, and I try and solicit feedback. I've done those sort of um, conversations on solar and farmland preservation, um, where I included local solar companies and farmers from the district. I had the College of Ag Health and Natural Resources, and I had environmental advocates and farmland preservation advocates all convening, inviting the public, and talking about that issue. Um, we've done the same thing about child mental health issues and school-based special education needs, um, where you just intentionally solicit feedback from the people who are interested. Um, and I do that because as a scientist, I know what expertise feels like. So I have this expertise in this one narrow thing. But throughout the district, there are hundreds of thousands of people who either taught themselves through work and advocacy or needing to do something, or actually through their academic career um, have created expertise in something that I don't have expertise in. I do this regularly with law enforcement. There's legislation coming forward that's going to affect the police. I never vote on those things without calling my chiefs. And I think that that's, that's the style of constituent work that I do. I expect you know, to build a really deep bench of experts that I can lean on in anything that I'm working on. So. That's good. You're getting feedback, which Absolutely. is great. And that's, and that's key. Um, so what is your next step if you are reelected for state representative? Uh, if I'm reelected, I have one piece of legislation that um, the problem carried over in a way and sort of grew um, since I worked on it. So this last year, we worked a lot on protecting seniors from banking and cryptocurrency related scams. We had pieces of legislation to protect seniors from taking out large amounts of money and giving it um, to a criminal enterprise unknowingly. We gave the bank tools to protect their constituents. But we also um, created a safer space around crypto ATMs, um, which is good. I'm not totally convinced um, we have gone far enough to make those spaces safer because I think a lot of their use is potentially problematic. Um, but I am noticing there's a specific type of scam called pig butchering, um, uh, which is when people um, are reaching out to people here who are vulnerable. They send them a message. They establish a relationship or rapport, switch the conversation to WhatsApp, an encrypted app. And they develop a relationship with you and they make you feel confident in, in investing with them and spending money. And people in our district, people in our towns are giving tens of thousands, if not millions of dollars, their hard earned life savings to criminals. And they're funding really horrific criminal enterprises, mostly overseas. But because of how that is working, it's really hard for our law enforcement to catch the money and take it back. If it's reported late, it's even less likely. Right. But what I'd like to do, because there's a money trail when you are exchanging money online, I would really like to see us leverage every ability we have to use blockchain analytics to create asset forfeiture. So if a senior citizen sends their money in a crypto investment, I want the state to be able to freeze that account and take back that money that the person sent somewhere it wasn't meant to be. And I have a constituent who fell for a crime like this. I think it was $134,000 that he sent away in the scam. He has documentation of everything throughout his conversation. and. There's a, a variety of different similar sorts of scams. 
And it's challenging if an arrest isn't made, if the money has moved too many times to get it back. So we need seniors to quickly report it, even though I think it's embarrassing for folks. It shouldn't be. It's happening to everybody, regardless of you know, your susceptibility. I think we need to make it easier for seniors to report these crimes. We need to make the, sure the police have all the resources that they need, which is technology, but also staff to trace these crimes. And I think we really do need to make sure that we um, create the ability to claw back the money right. and then not tax them on money they, um, they um, sent away unintentionally. Good. Is there anything else that you would like to add? I don't think so. I will just say, like, this is such a wonderful opportunity to meet people and talk to folks and get sort of the message out there. And I hope that if people ever need me, they reach out. Um, your state rep can help you change the law, but also advocate as your ally if there are things that are challenging. So I hope people do. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jamie Foster, for uh, coming to the station so we can talk and get some questions answered. Um, and we want everyone to vote for this election. Thank you for tuning in.